Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. All right, good morning, Verse by Verse Church. Let's open our Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews. We made it down to verse 14 on April 5th of this year. Uh, that was just before the Lord said, hey, come over here. I want you in these seven letters. Uh, and we now find ourselves, of course, living in a, a very different world than the one we were living in just a few months ago. We have had one crisis stacked upon another. We have had crisis squared here. Uh, and if God doesn't have the attention of the people of God in our day, I, I don't know when he ever will. If what we are facing uh, in the world today doesn't have us standing upon our toes at attention, uh, then we probably ought to take our spiritual pulse to see if we even have one. Now, there are two ways for a person to choose to look at what is happening in our world today. And, and which of those two ways you choose is a function of what you do with Jesus Christ and what you do with the Word of God. If you do not believe in the God in Christ presented to us in the Scriptures, you have every reason to be afraid and concerned about uh, the present and future condition of our world. However, if you are an authentic believer, if you believe in the saving work of Christ, if you subscribe to the truths presented in the word of God, then you should have an entirely different view. As Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, we do not grieve as those without hope do. Now, that does not mean that we don't lament it does not mean that we don't suffer loss. It does not mean that we don't experience anger and frustration. But what it does mean is that we understand there is a far grander and greater narrative flowing underneath it all. What we understand is what the Word of God unapologetically presents, that, that we serve a sovereign God who is in control, orchestrating eternal purposes in everything that he does. And if we will have spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear what God is doing in our nation today, we will understand that God is going about the business of saving souls. Now, the way salvation usually works is a person or a people uh, need to be brought to the end of themselves before they can see the beginning of Christ. People must recognize the problem of sin in their own heart before they can understand their need for deliverance. I believe what you and I are seeing play out on the national stage is God showing the church and God showing the rest of the nation this is what sin looks like in full bloom because he wants to save souls. As we said in closing last week, it's always been there. Sin and unbelief can lurk unseen, uh, but you and I, particularly here in the church in the uh, West here, uh, the affluence and, and 
comfort and all, we can become kind of inoculated to sin's reality. And now here God is holding up a mirror for us all to see, hey, this is what sin looks like, church, and I need you to see this. I need to reawaken you to the reality of sin if you're going to get up and get out there and kill it with the gospel. And I pray we don't need a further exacerbation on the part of the Lord to get our attention. It would be great if crisis squared could get the job done here, right? None of us wants crisis cubed, do we? I believe if you and I are ever to see gospel revival in our day, that day is today and that time is now. And so if we can have the sense to see what God is doing in our world today, spiritually speaking now, don't miss my point, spiritually speaking, this can and should be a time of tremendous hope and excitement. We cannot, we should not be looking at this as those without Christ do. We just can't look at it that way. God is moving and God is working. And this is an extraordinary time to be alive as the people of God. Man, let's recover that perspective, that way of looking at our world today. Because if we can do that, man, everything changes. And so here's what I'm saying spiritually. Crisis squared, all right, it's a good thing. It's a necessary thing. This is God working, and you should be fired up about that. And if we don't want to see crisis cubed, I think we need to stand up and repent and proclaim the gospel. Now, the other thing that I find absolutely compelling here uh, is how God has cared so intimately Uh, for us here at Verse by Verse Church. It would be very difficult to miss the overwhelming demonstration of his sovereignty over this body. Now, now pay attention because I want you to marvel over this. It's, It's rather extraordinary. Second Sunday in February of this year, God leads us to the book of Hebrews where we began to study the supremacy of Christ. This is what Hebrews is. It's it's an extended treatise on the supremacy and the superiority of Christ. And we all need that, right? I mean, none of us has a, a full understanding of the supremacy of Christ. Well, then on Easter Sunday, and this is where it all begins in my mind, the Lord directs us to a text in John chapter 20 in which the disciples are locked up and afraid behind closed doors. The resurrected Christ then shows up right there in the midst of their fears. They are then made glad, and they are going to be sent out, but not right away. Interesting. What was happening in the world at that time? Well, we were all told we needed to remain in our homes. We were locked up and afraid, as it were, because of this unseen physical virus. Well, then the Lord whispers in the ears of your leadership and leads us to break away from Hebrews to study the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, where the risen Lord himself gives the body of Christ at large, a kind of spiritual MRI. And if you go back and listen to some of those studies, it's rather surreal. In the weeks leading up to crisis number two here, we were saying to you through live streamed messages, because you were all sitting at home, we were saying to you, all right, now look, God is preparing to send his people back out into the world again. And so we need to look at these seven letters and and hold them up as a kind of mirror to our own church. As a church and as individuals, we need to get in this rhythm of confession and repentance. We know that God is moving. We know that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So let's get after this deal. And so we did. Now then, just as the lockdowns ease up and we arrive at the seventh and final letter, uh, crisis number two hits. We come to Laodicea, crisis number two hits, country's been on fire for seven days, people are killing people and robbing people and destroying one another's property uh, because we somehow thought more sin was a good response to sin. 
Now, nobody's locked up anymore, and everybody's out in the streets. That, that was a rather interesting turn of events, wasn't it? One day, we're told we can't leave our homes unless we go to buy food, and the very next day, it's okay to leave our homes if we're going to go riot in the streets. How did that narrative switch so quickly? Not sure how a thoughtful person can miss the deception there. Now again, man, look, buy whatever narrative you want to buy. It doesn't change the result. You can call, you can look at a cloud and you can call it cumulonimbus. You can look at a cloud and call it nimbostratus. You can look at a cloud and call it whatever you may. God still made it rain. Now, what has God done? He has allowed the slumbering American church to see the virus of sin in full bloom in its own backyard. The physical virus of COVID-19 had now given way to the, the virus of sin, a far worse virus that most of us knew had been there the whole time. But again, we really don't see it, do we? Not, not, not the way we should, not with the urgency that we should. We, we've just sort of swept it under the carpet that we might proceed with our comfortable and relatively affluent lives. And, and now God is saying, no, no, this is what sin looks like. It's always been there. But now I want you to see it so that my church will act. I've given you time to repent and refocus, and now I want you out there with the gospel of grace to kill this thing called sin. And is it not interesting, is it not remarkably compelling that just as this, this virus of sin suddenly blows up all around us where the, the need of proclaiming the gospel ascends to a kind of fever pitch that the Lord parks us in the seventh letter to Laodicea where you have an apathetic church that could care less about proclaiming the gospel and the love of Christ because they were all caught up in their comfort and their influence. Huh. Nice work there, Lord. We see what you did there. What did he say to this comfortable, affluent church? Man, you are making me sick to my stomach, but, but, I, but I'm, I'm still coming after you. Why? Because, because I love you, and I even like you, and so I'm standing at the door, man. Now open up, and let's get after it. Let's get the gospel out to a burning world. The timing is extraordinary, and it gets better further still. The hits just keep on coming. Here now, as we come back to the book of Hebrews, we are now beginning the next major section in this book, which is what? Christ is our great high priest. Well, what is a priest? What does a priest do? He takes men to God. Right now, a prophet takes God to men, but what does a priest do? Takes men to God. And so here we arrive now at the front end of this next major section in the book of Hebrews where we're dealing with a subject, by the way, that is only covered here in the New Testament. You're not going to find this anywhere else. These next six chapters now in the book of Hebrews, we are going to be dealing with, dealing with Christ as our great high priest. What are we going to spend the next several weeks doing? Studying the great high priest priesthood of Jesus Christ, studying how it is now that we take men to God. Oh, the timing. Are you picking up what the Lord's throwing down here? Like, you know, the Bible calls Jesus the rock over and over. Like, like he's smelling what the rock is cooking. <laughs> now, I can tell you, man, I, I love these elders that the Lord has brought uh, to lead this church. These are beastly men of God, in my opinion, and, and they're pretty sharp guys. But I will tell you right now, there is no way that even those sharp brothers could have ever planned or pulled off how God has so intimately led this church through the days in which we are living. There is an indelible imprint, like, like this stamp of intimacy imprinted upon his leading this church church that should cause in all of us a tremendous joy to behold, a tremendous joy to be a part of God's work here. 
I mean, God has been moving us through his word and, and, and lockstep with his will in the world. It, it's really a rather remarkable phenomenon to behold. And so here we are now, right back into the good grind and the good ground of the book of Hebrews, where the overarching theme of the book is the supremacy of Christ. Jesus is supreme. Now, the sub-theme of this very next section of text is keep coming to Christ. Right, just keep coming. Don't stop halfway. Don't stop. Just keep coming. You keep coming. You enter into the fullness of this rest that he is offering you. Why? Because he is supreme, preeminent, superior to everyone and everything. That's what we studied for the first four chapters. He is the reason to keep coming. He has no parallel, no equal. He has no competition. There is no match for him. No one can provide what he offers, a better sacrifice, a better covenant, better promises. And so the writer of Hebrews is going to be telling you and I this morning, draw near, man. Come all the way. Don't shrink back. Don't let go of the confession you've made. Not now, not ever. You keep coming. It's a great message in the text. The only hope for our fractured nation is not the morality and the ethics that they can get from Dr. Phil and Oprah, all right? We need to present to the appetites of those without hope what is infinitely more satisfying, infinitely more valuable, infinitely more wonderful and beautiful than the appetites that are presently competing for their attention. Why? You know this because whatever a person holds up as supreme in their affections, whatever a person delights in most, then that's where the rest of their world's going to go. And so therefore, as the people of God, we must lift up the person and works of Jesus Christ as having supreme value and supreme worth in the universe. But before we can do that, before we can do that, we must first hold Jesus up as having infinite value and infinite worth in our own hearts. You can't give what you don't got. And so back to Hebrews we go now, and I cannot think of a better place for us to hang out heading into this summer, praying for a kind of spiritual summer to come upon the church. So we get after it and go to work again now. Here in the incredibly rich waters of the book of Hebrews, verse 14 of chapter 4. Now, here we go. Verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, a phrase the Jews would be intimately familiar with, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. What confession? Well, that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, super rich text right out of the gate here. Now, to get you back into the, the scene here uh, with Hebrews with, with tremendous brevity, Paul is writing to a group of Jewish believers here uh, somewhere outside of the great, uh, greater Palestine area, uh, mid-60s AD, that are having tremendous pressure applied to them to go back to Judaism, to go back to the law and back to religion. And the writer of Hebrews, whom I believe is the Apostle Paul, the, the writer is saying, man, look, don't do it. All right, you keep coming. You have the superior thing. Hold fast to your confession. Uh, like, look, you've got Christ. All right, uh, why would you want to trade in your Ferrari even up on a Ford Pinto? Like, why would you do that? 
And this is what he's done for the better part of the last four chapters. He has presented Jesus as superior to all the people and things upon which they were leaning. He is better than the prophets. He is better than the angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua. And as a matter of fact, boys, the person and works of Christ is to, is to whom uh, all these people were pointing to. Now, it probably wouldn't hurt you to go back and listen to the first study in Hebrews. We've all slept a number of times since then. Uh, if you want to immerse your brain back into the context and setting for this letter. But what you had at the end of the day here uh, is a rather large assembly of, of predominantly Jewish believers that are enduring a great deal of pressure from where? From within their own Jewish culture. Okay, And in that respect now, you and I as Christians living in 2020 America, well, where's the pressure coming from? Right here in our own backyard. I don't know that there's ever been a time in my lifetime where the voices are so many and, and, and so divided. And so our need in one respect is very much the same as theirs. We need to hold up the voice of Christ and the word of God as supreme over all of the other narratives flying around out there. We need to what? Hold fast to our confession. Now, here again, we're moving into a new section in Hebrews where the writer will spend a number of chapters now unpacking why Jesus is a better high priest than your high priest of Judaism. Now again, one by one, right down the line, the writer of Hebrews has dismantled all the sacred cows of Judaism from the prophets and the angels to Moses and Joshua. The writer is in the process of demonstrating the superiority of Christ to all people and all things. With this new section now, he is now going to begin to demonstrate at great length why Jesus is superior to the Old Testament priesthood why he is better than Aaron, why he is better than the Jewish office of high priest. And, and by the way, th this is one of those unfortunate places where uh, when we uh, came in and assigned a chapter and verse to the original manuscripts, there, there are times where we um, can miss the boat. This is one of those times. What we have here in verses 14 through 16 really should come at the top of chapter 5. At any rate, we're dealing with a very Old Testament topic here, the high priesthood of the Old Testament and why Jesus is called our great high priest here in verse 14. Now, maybe somebody's saying, well, all right, Mr. Pastor, man, guy, sir, why should I give a rip about all this Old Testament stuff? I mean, you've, you're going all Levitical on me here. Like, why in the, what in the world does any of this have to do with me today? And my answer to you would be, in one word, everything. And that's why the writer's going to spend six chapters here. But, but let's do this. Let, let's do this. Let me give you a far better question. Because I really want you to see this, man. I, I want you to understand why the priesthood is so important. Here's the better question. Why did God wait so long to send Christ into the world? Have you ever wondered, that, have you ever wondered about that? Like why God had planned such a long and protracted history with Israel before sending his son in what Galatians 4 calls the fullness of time, time to, to die for our sin? Like, like, have you ever wondered that? No? Leonard? Well, you're going to wonder that this morning, and you're going to like it. But why did God drag this deal out? Like, like why were there 2,000 years between the choosing of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and the coming of Christ in the gospel of Matthew? Was it because history just runs on its own power, and, and, and God just somehow couldn't get the biscuits buttered? I mean, I mean, is that it? Like God just couldn't get history to do what he wanted it to do and it just took a really long time. Well, certainly that can't be it because the Bible tells us that God had planned the coming of Christ in the fullness of time before the foundation of the planet. 
Daniel 2, Galatians 4, Ephesians 1. And the Bible also just happens to present God repetitively and pervasively as sovereign over history. Well, okay, well, well then, why not send Jesus in Noah's day? Or just after the Tower of Babel, or in the days of Israel's bondage in Egypt, or, or any number of times. Why the long delay? Let's pray. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> here's why. Because there needs to be context for the Son of God. Hear me. Here's why. There needs to be context for the Son of God, which interprets why he is here and what he is doing. There needed to be categories in place that would allow humanity to make sense of his purpose and his mission. God did it this way for the understanding of his children. It, it's a little something we call, theologians call, progressive revelation. It's how God has chosen to reveal himself to humanity. In, in fact, if he did it all at once, you would never understand it. And so one of the huge reasons for the history of Israel and the record of the Old Testament is to give you and I, the people of God, context and categories for understanding the fullness of who Jesus is and why he came. Listen to me. If you try to skip over the Old Testament and interpret Jesus within your own context first without the biblical historical context and categories, you're going to make Jesus a coach, a therapist, a model, a mentor, a trailblazer, some kind of a spiritual guru, all of which may be true in part, but you're going to miss the fullness and the depth and the beauty of who he is and what he came to do. Now, without the context and category of the priesthood, we would be missing the very foundational core of what Jesus came to the earth to accomplish, namely to save sinners. And that's why it's so important, and that's why the writer is going to spend so much time, six chapters. Now, anytime the Word of God spends six chapters drilling down on something, you can bet that what it's drilling down on is a pretty big deal from God's perspective. He wants you to know and just marvel over the brilliance and beauty and majesty of who Jesus Christ is. This is going to be awesome. Now, what does the writer say right out of the gate about this great high priest? Well, notice there, he says that he has passed through the heavens. Now, we're going to expand upon the priesthood in considerable detail over the coming weeks. But, but if we're going to grab, really grab what is being said here, we need to do a little homework for what these Jews already intimately knew, what they instinctively knew. They wouldn't have to think about what the writer's saying here at all. They knew exactly what he means by this phrase, that the priesthood was at the core of their heritage. In fact, the chief objection uh, that these Christian Jews were facing from their unbelieving friends and family members was, how can you have a relationship with God? You don't have a priest. And here the writer of Hebrews is saying, oh, yes, you do. You have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, it's that phrase right there that you have a priest who has passed through, all right? The idea of a high priest passing through, this idea and this language was instinctive to the Jew, all right? So let's do just enough homework to get us to the point of understanding what's happening in the text, and we'll grab a little bit more later. Now, and many of you may remember this from our study in Exodus. But once a year, on the Day of Atonement, right, once a year, <clears throat> Yom Kippur, the high priest of Israel would go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was in order to uh, sprinkle the blood of, of sacrificed animals upon the mercy seat there in the Ark to atone for the sins of Israel. As the high priest, as the earthly high priest, he was representing the sins of the people before God, offering on behalf of them all a blood sacrifice to cover their sin. Now, at once you can see a picture of Christ there, right? 
who carried the sins of all of his people before the Father on the cross. Well, well, he himself was the sacrifice, and again, we'll get into that. And of course, and, and you know this, that the entire animal sacrificial system of the Old Testament was given to the Jews by God as object lesson after object lesson after object lesson that innocent blood had to be shed for the remission of sin. This whole thing is utterly fascinating to me. Now, Unlike Christ, <clears throat> because the high priest himself was a sinful man like all the rest, right? Before he went into the Holy of Holies, he had to go through a, a ritual cleansing of his own. He had to offer sacrifice for his own sins because he was entering into, in that dispensation, the, the, the very direct presence of God. The Holy of Holies by way of review for some of you, was the innermost chamber in the temple where only the high priest could go and only once a year. Once a year, that's it. Nobody else had access. Do you understand that? Like nobody had direct access to the presence of God. It was walled off. Only one brother once a year could go. Now that's why the rending of the veil when Christ gave up the ghost at the cross was such a big deal because now that curtain, those layers, those barriers were wide open. We all have direct access to the presence of God. That's another Bible study, but it's fascinating, right? Right? And so the Holy of Holies was this innermost chamber. Now, in order to get there, in order for the high priest to get there, and this is where the the Jews really were dialed into the language that's being used here, in order to get there, um, the high priest would have to pass through three portals, if you will. Three portals, he had to pass through three barriers, three areas areas in order to get to to the Holy of Holies. He had to first pass through the outer court, all the way to your right. He would then pass through the holy place, which is where the Levitical priests would carry out their daily duties. And then thirdly, he would pass right on through into the holy of holies, where again, only the high priest was allowed once a year on Yom Kippur. And when he did go in there, I'll tell you what, man, he he got in there and got out of there as fast as he could. See, this was where the Holy of Holies, this was where the Shekinah glory of God would come and dwell and meet with the nation in that dispensation. You don't mess around with the glory of God. That's why you're going to get a glorified body because if if your body was subject to the direct presence of Christ today, it'd be gone, right? And so these guys were terrified to go in there. Now, um, as we were making this slide uh, I didn't see quite enough glory there over the Ark of the Covenant, so I had to call Wilkinson and get him on the phone. Ed, can you dial up the glory there a little bit? I, I need a little more glory there uh, in the most holy place. And he kind of tried to do that with a little sunshot there, but um, well done, by the way, sir. Uh, but that, that's where the glory of God. So, so terrified were these guys going into the presence of God that they, what they would do was that they had bells attached to the hem of their garment to the hem of their robe so that the people outside could hear him moving and know that God hadn't struck him dead. And just in case he did, tradition tells us they would tie a rope around his ankle so they could yank him out of there if they needed to. So believe me when I tell you that high priest, he got in there and did what he had to do and got out of there in a hurry. Okay, that's the point we're making. And so the ancient high priest priest, he had a three-portaled entry in coming before a thrice holy God, you see. And he had to do it year after year after year, and he had to do it very swiftly. Now, what the writer of Hebrews is communicating here is that the great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, this this high priest had not passed through earthly portals, but he had what? Passed through the heavens. Now, Bible student, notice that's plural. Heavens. All right? Now, isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting how the Bible mentions a third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? That was the Apostle Paul. I was caught up into the third heaven, right? 
Isn't it interesting? The Bible mentions what is called a third heaven, often called, by the way, the heaven of heavens in the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 14, 1 Kings 8, 2 Chronicles uh, 6 among them. In the language of the scriptures, the first heaven is our atmosphere, all right? The second heaven is the interplanetary uh, in the interstellar space. Matthew McConaughey went there. And of course, the third heaven outside of both of those is what you and I think of as, of as heaven, the eternal abode of God. And that's where this great, great high priest ends up. This is insight into the ascension, is it not? Jesus passed through heaven number one, heaven number two, and Jesus passes through heaven number three, fulfilling what the earthly priest's portals were but a shadow of. Are you with me? Three for our thrice holy God. Fascinating. What symmetry there. And guess what? The father didn't tell him, all right, now, Jesus, you better get in and out. You got, you got, you got 24 hours to get this deal done and get out. No, no, no. What happened? He stayed there. He stayed there, didn't he? Do you see the contrast? Do you see what the writer of Hebrews is doing here? He's saying, you have the high priest, right? You have the great high priest that these earthly high priests were merely shadows of, what they were pointing to. Your great high priest, right? Your great high priest passed not through earthly portals, but heavenly portals, and he didn't get out of there for fear of his life. He stayed there. Because you see, he was God himself. The great high priest is who? Jesus, the son of God. He himself was God incarnate in the flesh. He didn't have to get out of there. He went home. Now, Jesus is his earthly name, Yeshua, Joshua in the Old Testament, right? And it means savior, but it's a human name. The son of God, what's that? That's his deity. That's his divinity. The son of God is who? The second person of the triune God, right? right? He is God the son. So Jesus is fully human, but he is also fully God. Fascinating. Now we call this the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Not like humanity and divinity, listen to me, humanity and divinity are fused in the person of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Which makes him what? Humanity, divinity, fused in Christ, which, which makes him what? The perfect bridge between men and God, because he is both. Listen, God meets man in Christ. God meets man in Christ. He is therefore the great high priest doing what? Taking men to God. And so listen, he didn't have to get out of there as fast as he could because he is holy and because he went home. And he's the second person of the Trinity. He went home, but he took humanity with him. And he stayed there. And it gets better yet. Now, not only did he stay there, but what did he do? And we saw this in chapter 1, if you remember. When he had made purification of sins, what did he do? He sat down. Right, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. These earthly priests are flying out of there just as fast as they can. Jesus says, I'm going to sit down. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to sit down. What does that mean? It means his work is finished. It's done. Do you know what you're never going to find in the holy place or the holy of holies in either the tabernacle or the temple? Do you know what you're not going to find there? A chair. Now, you got the altar of incense there. You got the table of showbread. You've got the lampstand. The priests are bouncing around in the, whole, the holy place all, every day, all day, doing their priestly work. But, but, but you know what you don't have in there? A chair. Why? Because their work was never finished. 
Jesus sat down because his work was done. It's the same thing he said when he gave up the ghost on the cross, right? John 19, 30. It is finished. This great, great high priest doesn't have to go back day after day and year after year. It's done. And listen, man, that, that's the essence of Christianity. Christianity isn't do. Do this, do that, do the other. Christianity is not do. Christianity, biblical Christianity, is done. And we should enter fully into that rest. In fact, that's the invitation. We'll see it in a bit. You are not made right. Now, we know this, but oh, but reminder is the mother of learning, according to Peter, right? We know this, but man, man, we need to keep hearing it, man. We need to keep hearing it. You are not made right with God by what you do. You are made right with God by what he has already done. And so you keep coming, you keep coming, and you keep coming until you can apprehend that rest, until you can rest in his finished work. And, and, and that's the force, friends. That is the force of what the writer is saying here. Hold fast to your confession. You keep coming. You hold on. You don't let go. We have two commands this morning. This is the first one right here. Man, you hold fast. You keep coming. Don't let the pressure get to you, first century Jews. Don't let the pressure get to you, 21st century Americans. There is extraordinary rest here. Like, you keep coming. You have the superior high priest. He's passed through the heavens. He stayed there. He sat down. The work is done. He is there at the right hand of the Father where he, by the way, ever makes intercession for you. We're going to see that in chapter 7. Boom! We should go home right now. But we can't. There is so much more. Notice what he says next. This is extraordinary. Verse 15. I hope you brought a new face with you. Because we're going to melt that one, that, we're going to melt that mug right now. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot, underline this word, sympathize. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Weakness says, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Now, maybe you've read this verse a hundred times, all right? But what you need to appreciate here is that this was, this was absolutely radical, revolutionary thought in the first century. This was an incredible revelation in its ancient setting. Now, the Greeks, all right, the Greeks... They ascribed no feeling or emotion to the gods at all. The, the Stoics believed that the primary attribute of God was apatheia. And that's Greek for uh, the inability to feel any kind of sympathy or emotion at all. Because they reasoned that if God were subject to emotion, he would, he, he would be weak and therefore not God. Okay? Now the Epicureans, they believed that God dwelt in the intermudia. Now that's Latin for between two worlds. In other words, God lives in some complete detachment uh, between the spiritual and physical realms. And the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, they didn't believe it either. Like they didn't believe that God felt what men felt because everything in the Old Testament to the Jewish mind was stay away, stay away, stay away. Like Mount Sinai, don't go, don't go near that mountain, man. Keep your distance. Oh, the temple, uh, you can go in there once a year, but, but man, get out as quick as you could. Now, into this world comes this radical revelation of the great high priesthood of Christ that flies right in the face of the prevailing theistic thought of the day. And, and, and it says, no, 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 no. In Christ, we have a high priest who feels everything we feel. And in fact, God became a man in Christ for that very purpose. To take the hit for your sin? 
Well, absolutely and primarily, yes. But why else? Like, why else did God become a man in Christ? To be your great high priest who after after saving you could be of immeasurable value to you as the one who has blazed the trail for you, as one who has literally and figuratively walked a mile in man's moccasins and can therefore fully identify and sympathize with the human condition and the human struggle. Now, uh, this is where it gets fantastic. This word here for sympathize... Greek sympatheo, it means to have compassion by experience, okay? It means to have compassion by experience, to be touched with the same feeling of. It means sympathetic resonance. The, the idea in sympatheo is, is this is a sympathy born out of a like experience, right? Only we're dealing with God here, right? We're dealing with a supernatural sympathy. Uh, Listen to me. There are supernatural things that the instrumentation of the incarnation that has, how do I say this? Um, There are supernatural things that the incarnation brings forth that that you and I, I I just don't think we fully understand. It's like this. It's like this. Maybe this helps you. It is a fact that if you have two pianos in the same room, two pianos in the same room, it is a fact that if you strike a note on one piano, that very same string on the other piano will reverberate and and sound without anyone ever touching it. Right? Two pianos, same room. You hit a note over here, that same string is going to reverberate and respond without anyone ever touching it. Do you know what that's called in the world of harmonics? Sympathetic resonance. And that's the Greek word that's used here. Listen to me, because this is wonderful. Christ in the incarnation took on the very same instrument is is ours. He he was human like us in every way. And now get this. So so he takes on our instrument just like us human. But then get this. He takes that instrument into heaven with him. He passed through the heavens with his priestly body. When a chord is struck in the weakness of our human instrument, it supernaturally resonates in his. That's what this text is saying. That's the language that's being used here. Listen to me. There is no note of human experience that does not play upon Christ's exalted human instrument in the heavens. Man, I hope you're getting a hold of this. I hope you are marveling over this. I I am telling you, there was so much more than than what we think uh, Jesus is. He is greater than we could possibly understand. And it is here in the word of God that we discover these treasures that we might exalt him as we ought. Now, boy, that's fantastic. Now, the writer anticipates an objection In the second half of the verse, he says this. But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So he's anticipating an objection. And the objection usually goes something like this. Well, how can Jesus be tempted in every way as me? I mean, he was God for crying out loud, right? He never sinned. I mean, he never sinned. How how can you stand there and tell me that he's been tempted in every way that, that I have? And yet the reality is, it is precisely the very fact that he never sinned that caused him to experience a kind of duration and a kind of intensity of temptation far beyond what you and I as sinners will ever feel. And, and here's what I mean by that. When you, we, we touched on this briefly in chapter 2, if you remember. When you, you, and I are, when you and I are tempted, what happens? Our temptation terminates at the point of our giving in. Right? 
When you and I are tempted, that temptation terminates at the point of our giving in. When you and I give in, we are no longer experiencing the temptation. We have sinned. We have satiated the temptation. We gave in. We scratched the itch. Now imagine, if you will, never, ever, ever scratching the itch. Because Jesus never sinned, he bore the intensity of temptation to the outermost ex- extreme degree, far beyond what you and, you and I would ever feel because we're sinners. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts it. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. And that is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to, yielded to temptation, is the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. C.S. Lewis calls him the only complete realist. You see, the reality is Jesus had taken the full expression of what hell could throw at him. He took the full expression of what hell could throw at him and he never gave in. This is the shocking reality that the Bible wants to make sure you've got settled in your heart. Okay, in him, like all the scriptures, in him was no sin. In him was no sin. He committed no sin. He who uh, knew no sin was made to be sin. Like over and over again, we could go on there. In him is no sin. And now keep in mind, he did this in a fully human body. The same instrument as ours. Now you think this through. Jesus took every temptation that came his way and he took it to its extremity in every single case, all the time, every time, because he never, he never gave in. Do, do you understand what's being said here? Listen, there are agonies of temptation that Jesus knows that you and I will never know. You ever sweat drops of blood? You ever done that? Well, maybe that makes a little more sense to you now. Here's what the writer of Hebrews wants you to settle in your heart. When you cry out to God, you are not crying out to some stoic, aloof, epicurean deity who is unfamiliar and unconcerned with your struggle. Every note of struggle on your human instrumentation, every string of temptation has rang to brain-boiling, blood-sweating decibels in Christ. And so when you go to Jesus, you remember this study. You remember this text. Whatever struggle it is that you are dealing with, he has taken that struggle to its extreme. There is no level of struggle, no duration or intensity of struggle or temptation that is foreign to him. I mean, look at Johnny's face. You'll see it right there. Look, he's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. He gets it. You Come to him and you expect full and tender and deep and profound and lively compassion. And you shall have it. And even then, even then he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop at pity, but rather he presses into provision. This is the good stuff right here. Finally this morning, verse 16. 
Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive what? So we're going to get something. What is it? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, this right here, friends, th- th- this is one of the grand revelations in this letter, all right? And I am convinced that it is our lack of walking in this provision right here that is at the core of so much of our needless suffering. Now, why don't we come? Why don't we come as we ought? And I believe the text has much to say about that. Number one, this is not the throne of judgment that the believer is coming to. Do we understand that? And the writer doesn't think these first century Jews do either because he wants to remind them here that Jesus transforms the throne of judgment into a throne of grace. All right? The throne to the Jew, Bible student, the throne to the Jew was always a throne of judgment and a throne of fear. When you go back to Ezekiel chapter 1, or 1 Kings 7, Jeremiah 3, Proverbs 20, Psalms 45, 89, 97, to name a few, the Jew saw the throne of justice and the Jew saw the throne of judgment. But what Jesus does now, you see, is he transforms that throne from a throne of judgment onto a throne throne of grace. He changed everything. Uh, listen, you are a Christian. You are a Christian if you name the name of Christ. If you are a Christian, there is no condemnation for you. We have to keep telling ourselves this because we don't walk like we know it's true. There is no condemnation for you. There is no judgment for those in Christ, Romans 8, 1, because Jesus has already been judged for us. Are you resting in that? When you think of the throne of God, what is the imagery that comes to your mind? Judgment or grace? Listen to me. It is not a throne of judgment for you. It is a throne of grace. And so come! Like you come to the throne of grace and you keep on coming. Now, notice how we are to come. First of all, we are to draw near. That's proserchomai, at present tense, active voice in the Greek. It means literally, keep coming close to, like, keep coming, man. That's what we've been saying. Keep coming. Now, how are we to come? With confidence. That's parousia uh, in the Greek. This is a very interesting word with a very long history in classical Greek. It means a bold frankness. It means free and open speech. It does not carry the I of, it does not carry the idea of disrespect or temerity. But but it is it, it is a, a, a a very aggressive word. It means you come without hesitation. You come without. Tentativeness. Do we understand what God is commanding here? And what a contrast to the trepidation with which the high priest would go into the holy place, right? Do we see what the work of Christ has done? Get excited about this. The veil has torn. This is not direct access to that throne. This is not just for the super spiritual elite once a year. It is the strong command given to every blood-bought believer, every child of God. Man, you come. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. And you come with boldness and openness and without any hesitation at all. Why? Well, we just saw it. Because there is a comprehensive compassion and a sensational sympathy that is going to be dispensed unto you. Because he knows the machinery you're working with, man. Psalm 103, 14, he knows what you're working with. He wore this body of flesh. He's walked in your shoes. And again, every one of those struggles walked out to the extreme. He gets it. He loves you. He was you. Now come. Come. And what do you get when you come? 
while with full and extraordinary and unparalleled compassion and sympathy. You get mercy and you get grace. What do we mean by mercy and grace? We mean you get it all. You get it all. Listen, you get mercy. Pay attention now. You get mercy for each and every and all past failures, right? And you get grace to meet every one of your present and future needs. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't. So you get it all, but you got to come. Look. Go to the Lord this week and ask him to show you. Man, man, why am I not coming? Why am I not coming? Do I not know who you are? Do I not know what you've done? Listen to me. And you know what? Look, look, just let me love you well, okay? If you're not coming and you're not coming often, you do not know the Jesus that is presented in the word of God, and you do not know what he came to accomplish as well as you ought. Now, don't you dare feel bad about that, all right? Don't you dare feel bad about that. You feel his grace and his mercy and his provision and his kindness and speaking lovingly and loudly and clearly to you this morning by his spirit illuminating his word. All right? What did he tell you today? He told you of the depth of his love for you, that he came way down, way, way down in condescension. He came down and took on flesh for you, took all of your sin, killed it in that cross, buried it in hell, now where it belongs. He took that bruised and beaten and bloodied instrument of his, and he brought it right back up to the throne of God where each and every dissonant chord of terror and struggle that sounds upon your earthly body is instantly heard and harmonized in his own exalted body there before the throne of God. There is not one single note that has sounded upon your soul that is not felt and reverberated in his own. That there is a, he has said to you, there is a kind of profound spiritual connection that that you enjoy and share with him that will blow Oh, your brain wide open one day. Maybe that's t- maybe that day is today. And God has told you today, I know your condition. I know to the nth degree. And I am gentle. And I am extending to you exceptional empathy and complete compassion and magnificent mercy and galactic grace. It is all yours. It is yours if you will come and you will come with confidence, if you will come without hesitation and come without tentativeness. Listen, you come, you keep on coming, come all the way in and keep coming closer. You make that your one thing, that you keep coming. You know, the apostle Paul said something interesting in Philippians chapter three. He, he, He said... This one thing I do. Paul says in Philippians 3, this one thing I do. What an extraordinary thing to say. Can you imagine having that kind of focus and that kind of resolve that where your life could be reduced to to one single irreducible minimum? Like what if somebody said to you and me, hey man, what's the most important thing in your, like what is your life all about? Would we say this one thing I do? Or would we say, well, and I got like 15 deals going on right now. I, you know, I got a lot on my plate. I suppose my affections are a bit divided. I think it would be a pretty awesome thing to say this one thing I do, wouldn't it? Well, what is it, Paul? I mean, come on, man. If you're telling me you can distill the Christian life down to one thing that you do, man, man, I gotta know, what is it? 
Brothers, I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it yet, but one thing I do. Now, here's how he does it, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Here's what he does. Here's the one thing. I press on. I keep coming. I don't shrink. I'm not what I am yet, but I'm going to keep coming. I, I, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, forget everything else. I want to be in Christ Jesus. That's it. That's all. That's the one thing I do. What is the Lord saying? Oh, and his sovereign care for us is unconscionably remarkable. What is the, what is the Lord saying to verse by verse church today? Press on Draw near, keep coming, come closer, come all the way in, come with confidence, come without hesitation, don't shrink back, you keep coming, verse by verse, church. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Your passion for us is compelling and astonishing and long-suffering. Father, I pray you would awaken within our hearts a desire to be filled with you, not what you give with you yourself. You are our prize. Give us the the lion heart of the Apostle Paul. Lord, you have a good and much needed work that needs to, to go forth in the world today. Your people need to hold up the gospel to a world that is getting drowned by false narratives and false appetites. But Lord, we need to to hold you as supreme in our hearts first now, don't we? Before we can proclaim you as as supreme to others. So God, I pray um, as we explore this text over the next several weeks here that you would just fill us with joy, fill us with delight, fill us with Uh, the extraordinary glory that is in Christ, that we might see and savor his glory. Help us to see his glory. Help us to savor that glory, that we might go and show that glory to a world in need. Lord, we love you so much. We just pray you would uh, just magnify yourself in our hearts this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name.